Okay, so in chapter eight, one thing is going to change. Uh, they're going to talk about these things called sampling methods, and you can read through those. I'm not going to test you on any of them, but there's some good illustrations on how you can use like Excel, for example, to actually extract your samples and your, from your variables. Um, we're going to talk about the central limit theorem, which talks about why the normal curve basically is what it is. And then one of the other things we're going to get into is the z-score formula will end up changing a little bit from chapter seven. But the whole basic idea behind chapter eight is we're still going to be using the idea of the normal distribution. Now, you'll kind of basically figure this out. Why take a sample and why not look at the whole population? And I'll just kind of summarize this pretty easily. Typically, the cost of looking at everything in a population most of the time is probably going to be prohibitive. It could also be maybe practically impossible, depending on what the population you're looking at. So um, the basic idea then is uh, this the whole thing in this, in this whole chapter is we're going to be basically looking at samples. And X bar is going to be basically the new idea. X bar is going to represent our random variable, of course, which basically means the sample mean. Now, you can just kind of read through these and look at some of the illustrations, but for the purposes, at least in terms of this class, uh, I'm not going to test you on all the different sampling methods, but there are methods out there that talk about how you can actually take a sample. And there's different ways you might want to select it, you know, basically based on your on, on randomness and unbiasedness and so forth in terms of what you're looking at. So next couple slides, you can read through that. I'm not going to really make too many comments until you get to the slide where we talk, you know, start to get into uh, the concept of standard error. So again, you can keep going, read through this. I'm not going to make too many more comments, but this kind of gives you a nice little illustration on how you can do a simple random sample. Notice on this one, uh, they start to use Excel. And typically that's going to be the case in most sampling methods is you're going to use some sort of, you know, computer technology. Okay, so now we get into this thing of sampling here. Just remember that the fact that you are taking a sample you're always going to be different than what the population is. So if you look at this thing, they call it the sampling error. So notice they're using X bar. That's going to be your sample mean. And if you compare that to the population mean, again, I was going to make a note here, sample mean versus the population mean, they're always going to be different. Just like the sample standard deviation is going to be different from the population standard deviation. Of course, the, the sample variance and the population variance. And of course, when we get into proportions later on, um, that difference typically they call a sampling error. Now, because of the applications of the normal curve, and we'll get into the belt, we'll get into the central limit theorem a little bit later. Uh, all of our sampling distributions will take the shape of a bell-shaped curve, with one exception. Well, not an exception, but the basic idea is, again, is x bar is going to be our random variable that we are going to be using. To convert into a z value. Now you'll notice right away they call it the standard error of the mean. This is a brand new concept that we haven't talked about yet. Notice what they do is they take the population standard deviation and they divide that by the square root of n which is of course your sample size. All right so this idea is basically going to be referred to as your standard deviation. But sometimes they call it several things. Sometimes they may call it simply the standard error of the mean. I've seen it referred to as the standard error of the sample mean. But the basic idea is, is now you're looking at the concept of sample size when you're calculating your z-value. And this is going to come up on a future slide, but I'm going to go ahead and write it in right here. So what you're going to find is eventually what the z-value concept is going to look like is we used to have x minus mu. Now x is going to become x bar. And then we're going to divide that by sigma over the square root of n to now get our z-score. So this new equation is going to be basically put in the denominator of your z-value formula. And that's basically the big difference between this chapter and chapter 7 on the normal curve. So what the central limit theorem basically is, and I'm going to use, it kind of says it down here, 
but it's kind of loosely used. But the basic idea is, is as long as you have a large sample size and they like to use n is equal to 30, not that that's going to be a large sample size for every single population you're trying to sample, but the, the idea is all about largeness of your sample size. And if you can get a large enough sample and you keep doing samples and samples and samples over and over and over again, the probability that your distribution is basically going to resemble a normal distribution will indeed happen. And that is why typically it's all about the central limit theorem idea. That's why this bell-shaped curve has such a lot of applications. It's because, you know, once you do enough samples, it does, and you, and you basically plot those sample means into a frequency distribution, it will indeed at some point in time resemble a bell-shaped curve. And this particular idea is showing you that, you know, when they were using different sample sizes, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 6, n is equal to 30 over various types of samples. Notice what happens when you look at the picture of the curve with a very, very small sample size. Nothing resembled a curve. You went up to 6. They started to kind of resemble, but there was some skewness. But it wasn't until they're trying to prove it. Once they got on all their samples where they had n is equal to 30, every single one of them started to resemble that the bell-shaped curve. Which is why they, you know, they typically say central limit theorem. They like to say it's the rule of 30. As long as your sample size is large, you're going to get a bell-shaped curve. And I'd mentioned this earlier, guys. This again is your new formula. But here's the nice thing: once you plug it into this equation, notice x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of it. Once you get this, and then you get a z-score. This is really the same as chapter seven, exactly the same as chapter seven, except now we're using a new formula but everything else in terms of how to use the tables is exactly the same so if you look at this number that says find find a z value for a sample mean of uh 31.8 so what what i didn't show you was that basically let's say your mu value was 31.2 sigma was 0.4 and let's say your sample size was 16 even though we're not at 30 we're still going to assume normal curve again all they're doing so you're taking 31.8 minus 31.2 divided by your sigma over the square root of n, and then they get a z-score that is 1.8. Once you get that, again, then you basically go to your probability table to look it up. And, and of course, in this case, if you were wanting to go to the right, obviously, if you looked up a 1.8 z-score in your table, you're going to get 0.4641. So obviously, if you just take 0.5, subtract 0.4641, you're going to get your answer.